Thanks for coming out. Welcome to the Vintage Computer Festival 2019. Appreciate y'all coming out here. It's fun. It's good to be a part of this. Um, it's the first time I've been up here. So, uh, in terms of presenting, I was here last year just to tour around and check it out. So. All right, so who is this guy, right? This, I'm Brian. I'm from Richmond, Virginia area. Been a technology guy pretty much my whole life. Got introduced to computers in elementary school. Uh, the rest is sort of history there. Uh, sort of always collected. My parents would call that being a pack rat, right? My wife would agree with that. Um, so, but intentionally started really collecting vintage computers around 2006. Um, I had a few things that I acquired before that, but that's kind of what I did. We can't see it about it, right? So my day job, I work as enterprise architect, so I'm in IT daily, with, uh, right now I'm with Child Fund International, it's a global nonprofit. Uh, prior to that, I was with a, another global nonprofit for about 10 years, uh, in a couple different roles in IT leadership and um, system architecture, things like that. Uh, <coughs> and prior to that, about 15 years in consulting and IT business. So, I can say, lifelong. <coughs> lifelong <coughs> And uh, really enjoy uh, the older I get, really enjoy the, the vintage computers a lot more than the new stuff, which is really uh, interesting. So I spend my day thinking about the future, and I come home and think about it. Fun. Uh, anyway, my email address is there. If you have questions or whatever, you want to reach out to me later, that's fine. I'd be happy to talk with you about anything. We have about uh, 70, 80 machines in our collection right now, and uh, like to get our machines out in front of people. Here. Where in Virginia? Uh, we're outside of Richmond, uh, so kind of the central part of the state. So a little mm -hmm. bit of a haul up here, but it was worth it. So what's next, right? Why are we here? Um, well, you'll see that picture there. That is the last technology conference I was part of. That was what we were talking about. When people would ask the question, "What's next?" We would say quantum computing, and just think about. It and looking at um, where we come from. Right? Obviously, there's lots of puns here. I made a place all for that. You know, the next computer, the next step operating system, et cetera, et cetera. What's next? When's the next guy going to be here? It's going to be more interesting to listen to, et cetera, et cetera. So luckily, if you are interested in quantum computing, we have uh, already thought of you here. Uh, so Come back in 2051, we're going to have a presentation on quantum computing here that will cover a lot of your questions. So, but for now, we're going to stick with uh, we're going to stick with the next uh, brief kind of reminder of the timeline here. What's going on? Steve uh, Jobs, of course, left Apple in the 80s. Not exactly on good terms, but uh, he decided he wanted to start his own, his own company. Build his own machines his way. He announced the first next computer around 1988 and started shipping them out in 1989. Their first market really was uh, universities and education uh, markets. Uh, they put those initial machines out around $6,500 when they released them to the general public, of course, and the price went up to around uh, $99.99. The initial machine that was, uh, that was put out there was the cube version, we'll talk a little bit more about the different models here in a minute. Uh, 1990, of course, second generation, right? No, no uh, computer family is good with just a single release. So they enhanced it, they moved to a newer, faster CPU, et cetera, et cetera. 1992, they released the turbo versions, which uh, moved up to the 33 megahertz and 40 processor. Um, and around 1993, they got out of the hardware business altogether. They recognized uh, that they couldn't compete in the hardware business and that their, their strength really was their operating system. We'll talk some more about that. And of course, 1996, 1997, uh, Next was acquired by Apple and Steve Jobs came back to Apple and uh, sort of the rest is history there. So we talk about the cube, right? There's a couple different revisions of the hardware and you can see Try that again. All right, 
right, so this is the uh, this is the cube version. Unfortunately, we don't have one to display. I understand there is one in the museum, and there may be uh, one or more on display uh, in the exhibit area tomorrow and Sunday. If you want to see one hands on uh, cube machine, this is the the original release. The next station, uh, this this version actually came later. Um, cube came out in 1989, and was rides a couple times in its lifespan. Pretty innovative, pretty interesting design. It's all together in one box. A little harder to work on than this lab. A little more expensive, obviously. The uh, slab version, they were told not to call the pizza box. Everybody else called theirs a pizza box. So Steve had to come up with a really unique and you know marketing genius type name, so they came up with slab. Not really sure if that was the best thing they could have called it, but it's a good descriptor. It was a lower cost version. Did not have some of the enhanced graphical capabilities that the cube offered with some of the graphic things just next dimension. So why, right? What's interesting about this machine? They made about fifty thousand of them. They came and went within a span of ten years. Who cares, right? It's twenty years later. Why don't we care about this machine? Well. There's a few different reasons, and this, my personal opinion is that Next contributed a lot to what we would consider a modern day technology, right? If you look around, uh, a lot of the technology that we use today is heavily influenced by Next and their hardware as well as their software. Let's talk a little bit about that. Obviously, uh, it served as the starting point for Mac OS X, right? So after the acquisition, uh, next, back into Apple. Apple had been searching for ways to come up with a new operating system to replace um, the old classic Mac operating system versions that had been there for years and years and years. They were looking for people to help build something. They tried to build some things themselves. They tried to acquire some other things. Uh, so they came to Next Step as their foundation for Mac OS X. Of course, it's built around the Mac kernel. It's a Unix-like operating system. It's got some BSD source code in there. Uh, stable, proven technology, right? And then, of course, Next Company, Next Software, at that point in time, had built a nice graphical user interface around it. And they had some of the things that, that we would re even recognize, you know, this dock area here, of course, it's the wrong part of the screen, but uh, that concept was part of the Next Step operating system. The spinning beach ball, right? You know, Waiting for your machine to do something instead of doing the hourglass. The play those, of course, they had the beach ball, and that still exists in uh, versions of MacOS today. A lot of the sound clips are the same. If you actually listen to the sound clips on the next operating system, uh, a lot of them are very similar or exactly the same. Say chess game, a lot of similarities, right? A lot of stuff came straight over uh, into what's now modern day MacOS from, from these beginnings, from the sound clips. What's, what else did they do? A lot of computers provided sort of a single spark or a single bit of innovation that transcended the industry, right? Well, the cool thing I think about Next is they actually had a lot of things that influenced what we, what we see today and where technology went uh, even after their demise, right? So, good design, right? I mean, this is kind of what the late 80s and early 90s was looking like, right? You know, it was a pile of beige boxes, everything kind of looked the same. Even Apple had kind of gotten away from their roots. Once Jobs left Apple, design wasn't important, right? Everybody just wanted to blend in. They didn't want to be unique. They didn't want to be interesting. They wanted to be as cheap as possible, right? Let's take some cheap metal and paint it beige and, and sell it as cheap as we possibly can. So the next was kind of interesting in the fact that it really kind of reinvigorated the idea that, no, you actually can invest some time and energy into a good design of your computer, and you can make something that not only looks cool, um, but obviously has a lot of pretty advanced capabilities as well. Thinking about how that age looks today, obviously, there, there weren't many other companies at this point in time, we're talking late 80s, early 90s, right? And maybe SGI was, uh, Pretty innovative in the design of their machines. Of course, the price tag was about three times this. Some of the Sun workstations look pretty cool, but average PCs, pretty boring. 
Obviously, that had influence on in the hardware design as well. Even the materials, right? I mean, this thing is is magnesium. You know, sort of coated in this rubberized plastic here. It's not tiny sheet metal, right? This is this is a high quality machine. The shielding is built right in. Nobody else was building computers out of magnesium, right? Digital signal processor, right? The next computers came on board were DSP, more than 56,001. I've got a data book over here if you're really interested in reading up on that. Why was that cool? Well, at the time, they really didn't have a lot of ideas for what it could do, right? And they used it to do some music demos and things like that. We think about modern computers today with uh, GPUs and things, uh, silicon that's custom made to do matrix operations and things like that. Um, this was pretty, pretty ahead of its time to saying, well, this isn't something we're just going to optionally throw into an expansion car. We're going to put this right on the motherboard uh, and make it available to developers on every machine. 10 base T Ethernet, right? A lot of folks, you know, a lot of machines may have had the old, uh, you know, BNC connector for 10 net, or they may have had AUI ports and things like that, but literally having a 10 base T port right on your machine without having to do an expansion card, at the time, pretty innovative. Of course, nowadays, it's, it's uh, expected. Right. What about the software side of things, right? Talk about the operating system a little bit. Next was very influential in bringing sort of object-oriented programming to the masses, right? Uh, packaging, and this was one of the areas where Steve Jobs always excelled. Just taking things and putting them together and packaging them in a way that they could be easily consumed and easily used by, by developers, by end users, etc. Um, they had a full integrated development environment. This was when people were still writing C++ on DOS and you know, early Windows applications where they were literally writing machine code and things like that. So uh, pretty advanced at the time and it kind of set the standard and set the, uh, set the pace for what development looks like. See, of course, uh, an interface builder. These are things that still exist. They're still used. Objective C, obviously, in, uh, in mobile applications. Interface builder, if you're building modern Mac OS applications, you're still using uh, derivative interface builder. I've heard, I haven't seen it personally, but <coughs> some of the classes are even still called NS something in reference to next step uh, when, you get into, when you get into the software development. Obviously, there was a lot of influence on the World Wide Web. Wait a minute. Okay, so there's probably a lot of jokes here on maybe kind of who and how the internet came to be, and we'll, we'll stay away from that. Um, but obviously, Next played a crucial role in the, the World Wide Web, right? The creation of things like the browser, the web server, website content. Tim Burks Lee obviously put that stuff together when he was at CERN, and that is the actual <coughs> next cube that he used, the first web server. There's a little label there that says well, don't to, power to, this thing off. To say that Next was involved is kind of specious because the guy just happened to own a Next. That's true. That's true. But he would have developed it on whatever he would have developed it on something. But well, you know, yeah. it did perform the first web server function. There know, is some claim though that the next, the next interface, the ease of use, ease of development, you know, did significantly enable him to put all those pieces together much faster. Than Absolutely, it might have taken longer. Next. It certainly might have taken longer. And he built this on, you know, a a traditional Unix platform, some workstation, something else that would have been uh, comparable at the time. But you know, he built it on this. So yeah, I think the steps are saying that was his choice. That was his choice of platform. I think so. I mean, I think he had a choice in, in deciding to, to purchase that machine. It was we, we certainly like to think that. Well, maybe we'll get him here next year. He can answer the question. Yeah, that would be good. What do you think? That would be excellent. <laughs> so, anyways, whatever, whatever. Uh, like I said, whatever you think about those sort of the origins and history of the internet, that's probably a fantastic topic for a whole session or a whole data session. But it was there. It was there early on, and some of those first web pages were put together on this hardware, and the next step up was this one. And of course, what's more influential than that, right? 
did software used next in the development of Doom Game Engine. Again, maybe it was convenient, but they purchased it specifically for that project. It wasn't just something they had sitting around. That's the beauty of a $9,000 machine. Most people don't just have them hanging around. Well, I got nothing to do with this machine. Let me write a game. They purchased it specifically for that purpose. And um, that screenshot is actually from this computer running Doom uh, just a few weeks ago. So obviously lots of influence here. And for me, I think about this and I think about, personally, my opinion is that um, even Apple today owes a lot to these beginnings, owes a lot to this. Because had, had Apple not made the decision to purchase Next, and Apple not made the decision to include Steve Jobs in that acquisition, bring him back on board, where he could bring some of these ideas much more into the mainstream, particularly in the area of design, right? I mean, one of the first things, you know, beyond the, the Mac OS and operating system, right? One of the first things uh, to come out of Apple after uh, Steve Jobs came back on full-time CEO was innovative looking machines, iMacs and things, and iPods. You know, things that were designed was in the forefront. And I think if someone else had stepped into this role, they might have brought a great operating system to the table. Uh, but who knows where Apple would be today and what our devices and what our, what our computer platforms look like today. So first, I feel like there's a lot of influence here, even though it's an obscure machine. We don't see it that often. Not many of us, me included, had the opportunity to literally use this as their daily machine. But it's worth remembering, I think. And there's a lot, uh, there's a lot of good stuff here. So okay, cool, right? Great machine. I like it. You convinced me. I should care about it. So what do we do? Let's talk a little bit about the hardware, right? I mentioned kind of three generations of hardware families that were built. Uh, the original Next, and that was a cube version. Uh, 25 megahertz of a 30 processor. 864 meg RAM. Had the monochrome display, 17 inch grayscale display. Um, had fairly standard stuff, right? SCSI drives, three and a half inch floppy drive. Had this magneto optical drive, which was not terribly reliable and uh, wasn't well adopted. That was replaced in a later version with a regular CD ROM drive. Second generation, they enhanced the cube to an 040 25 megahertz processor. They ditched the, the magneto, magneto optical drive, replaced that with traditional CD-ROM drive, went with the 2.88 megabyte floppy because, you know, I don't know, IBM, PS2, I, I don't know why they thought that was cool. But anyway, they put that stuff into the next. They also introduced the slab. Wasn't there a, was there a hard drive in, in the, yeah, they, the they, second they, generation? Yeah, they all use, yeah, they all use SCSI hard drive. Um, they're different bearing capacities. But there was no hard drive in the original cube, right? There yeah, was? Yeah, like three, three, 330 meg SCSI drive. So, the, I mean, the operating system wasn't available. I thought before. everything was on the, the magneto, the optical drive. No, that was essentially, you know, for additional storage. But there there was place there for, for an internal SCSI library. Oh, okay. In the original model as well. The, the magneto optical drive is also very slow. The access time is very slow. The second generation, of course, is when the, the original next station, the cost reduced version, was released. Uh, and then a couple years later, of course, they put out the turbo versions of both the next station color and monochrome. This is a monochrome uh, next station turbo. They also put out the turbo version of the cube, all running 33 megahertz of. At that point, the, the, the FPU was integrated uh, into the chip rather than being a separate chip. Uh, the DSP was still present, and they had external, you know, off of, fairly off the shelf graphics chips, VT graphics chips. Here's where it kind of gets fun. We'll talk a little bit about more about some of these details, right? So, this. Before the session starts, someone's talking about when well, you can go pick one of these guys up for a minimum of 100 bucks or so, but it's all of the extra stuff you need to really make it work uh, that sometimes becomes a challenge. And uh, I'm going to demonstrate and put all this together to show you how it fires up. 
But one of the things that's kind of strange about this machine is that the monitor gets its power from the computer. There's also the interface for the sound, the interface for the keyboard and mouse. In some cases, they're in an external unit, right? They're either in the monitor, which I'll show you, or the sound box, which I don't have. Uh, but the sound box will have some of these ports on it that allow you to connect. And then one cable goes back to, um, come back, comes back to the main unit. Kind of strange, kind of interesting, makes it interesting to collect for today because uh, some of those pieces are hard to find, right? Everybody tosses out things like this because that doesn't look very useful anymore. In fact, that probably costs more than the whole thing. The power button's on the keyboard, right? So some of these things were picked up by Apple. A um, couple different video interfaces as well. Monochrome has this 19-pin this uh, video interface that also carries, again, the power, it carries the sound, and it carries the uh, keyboard and mouse interface. Um, some of the later models actually switched over to use Apple Desktop Box, the ADP interface. So you've got two, but the connectors look the same almost. So you know it's, it's easy to confuse these things and get not get the right combination of parts. So it's stuff to watch out for, right? If you're if you're interested in picking one of these up, you've got one, you're trying to fire it up and get it going, um, things like that. Couple things to pay attention to, right? The cubes are, of course, harder to find. They're more expensive. They're cooler looking in a lot of cases, but they do have their own challenges, right? The other cubes, like I mentioned, have the magneto optical drives. A little bit of reliability issues there. Uh, the next station, of course, is available in actually four different variations. We've got the non-turbo color, the non-turbo monochrome. You also have the turbo color in Primary differences, pretty obvious from the right? Batteries, any vintage computer, always a battery to think about. Um, luckily, these are not quite as bad about leaking as some of the other types of rechargeable batteries, a lithium battery, but um, it's still something to pay attention to, watch out for. And interestingly, I don't know if the person that emailed me is here, is here today, but someone emailed me just a couple days ago as I was getting ready for this. And they had an old cube that had been on the shelf for a long time, pulled it off the shelf, battery was dead, try to boot it up. By default, the cube wants to boot, this is an original cube, wants to boot to the magneto optical drive. You actually go, go into the monitor and change the boot preference. It loses that when you take the battery out. Something to watch out for. Okay. Aren't they, like Max, they won't boot without a battery? They, well, if you set the monitor correctly, it will boot, it won't reboot. Uh, but it's similar to, it's probably closer to like a sun workstation, right? You can kind of, if the pram battery goes bad in the sun workstation, you can kind of hack your way around and get the boot. Some Macs will boot that way, some won't. Uh, my experience with these have been, you know, with or without the battery, you can get it to boot, but of course, you might have to go through some commands in the monitor to get it set up correctly. Uh, my expectation is that the slab and the, and the, um, the newer cubes that did not have the magnetic optical drive would default boot to the scope disk. But that's that's a guess. I haven't, I haven't tried that first one. Maybe we'll test that out and see what happens here. Uh, the reliability tends to be good. When you when we look at this thing, of course you'll see a lot of these, you know, just dreaded early 90s surface mount capacitors, but uh, in my experience have been pretty good with those. They're not they're not super cheap ones. They don't tend to leak as much as some of the ones in, in some of the Apple products at the same time frame, of course, this is a $10,000 machine compared to a $2,000 machine. Maybe they spent a couple extra bucks on caps in this. Maybe we just got one. Uh, some people say the monitors get them over time. I think that's pretty typical of CPU or, or running the CRT monitors, but something to watch out for, something to take a look at. If you're looking at one and trying to get a complete setup with a with monitor, it'd be something to pay attention to. Uh, the video is Theoretically adaptable to a more modern type of display, VGA, things like that. There's adapter cables, there's people on eBay that build boxes and things like that that claim to work. I have no experience with any of them personally, uh, but in, in theory, the sound, you know, in theory sound, right? The, the challenge is not the video itself, it's all the other signals that 
pass between the monitors. So let's dig in. Let's take a look at the turbo here. This is the uh, Next Station Turbo Monochrome version. And as I mentioned uh, a little bit ago, of course, it has the magnesium shell. One screw to take it off the back. It's a very easy machine to work on. It's not completely toolless, but one little screw on the back gets you out of the way. Yeah. Uh, here's the here's the internals of the machine itself. Of course, you got power supply here. Uh, you've got four RAM sockets on this. The cubes have a lot more RAM sockets. Uh, most of these will max out maybe 32, 64 meg. Uh, some of the newer cubes will go to 128 meg. Um, some of them have uh, at least eight, eight sockets available for memory. Uh, Seagate SCSI disk here in this particular model. Uh, of course, this is a standard floppy drive here. Motorola processor buried under this heat sink here. Again, the turbo version, so this is a 40, 33 megahertz. Got a cooling fan here that kind of looks like it does nothing uh, because it's just mounted back here at the bottom. But you notice on the bottom, there's these cooling vents. So the airflow can actually flow through here to the fan. That's how they got this really low profile form factor here. Power supply. It doesn't actually pull, pull air through the, through the power supply, does it? No, the power supply is actually bolted to these cooling fans. This is like a giant heat sink on the yeah. bottom of the power right. supply, and then this just blows air, allows airflow across it. So when you set this down on the desk, you don't block the airflow, you still get some, uh, again, those design points uh, are interesting in the count, right? Standard power input, obviously, uh, thankfully, at least for that. Networking connections. Printer connection, this is a, a, a I want to say proprietary, it's not proprietary signaling, but this is a serial port that was built for this purpose uh, to attach to that, uh, to that printer. Uh, here's the 19 pin video connector. This is the connector that you'll see on the monochrome versions. Again, the color versions you'll see an actual 13W3 connector, but keep in mind it's got some extra signals in there. Uh, this is a DSP interface, which uh, could be used theoretically for like capture, audio, video capture, things like that. Um, and external SCSI port and a couple of um, RS-423 serial ports here. Uh, these are supposedly pin compatible with the serial ports that you would find on that output pot here. Thinking about building your own uh, video cable, <clears throat> you know, to attach to that unit, there's a guy on eBay selling packages of the 19 pin uh, sockets yeah, those D sub 19 pin D sub connectors are not yeah, so very common. It's a non standard, typical jobs. Yeah, yeah, we don't need 25 pins. You know, everybody else has got that. We're gonna, we can do with 19. So that's kind of a quick little tour around the outside of the machine. I'm actually, gonna connect her up here real quick and we'll fire up. Is it uh, using open firmware? Do you know, like what is the kind of boot prom stuff? That, that, that is a great question that I do not have any details on, to be honest with you. It's not I'm talked about a whole lot. Yeah, um, I'm wondering if it's hard to get into it, like if it's uh, or even possible. To, to sort of uh, tinker with or modify? Yeah, well you talked about changing the boot yeah. drive, so someone must have accessed yeah, that. Well, yeah, drive. there is. And, and, and if, if it fails to boot, it will actually boot into a monitor. It will. Uh, so which will give you some abilities to uh, to work with that. Yeah, so, look at devices and all that. It's probably open firmware. Then. Sun was using that yeah. at this time. Like, surprise, 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 surprise. Yeah, it is. It's not open firmware. Yeah. Oh, no, no, come on. <laughs> In, uh, maybe 93, 94. This is net, this, this is jobs. Yeah, there's still a lot of open firmware would not nearly be elegant enough. Not for something as cool as a slab, right? That's right. It's pretty easy to uh, get everything going. Once you do have the 
before the monitor connected, again, the power switch is right here on the keyboard. So there's the monitor. It's booting up right now. It's yep. showing the monitor. And the OS hasn't started yet. Correct. It's booting. Yeah. Pretty standard keyboard. Nothing really special here. Like I say, the primary thing is the power key. They were probably a little ahead of their time with the um, brightness controls and things like that on the keyboard. A lot of that's commonplace <laughs> nowadays on laptops and uh, especially Mac. Is that a weird modifier key? Like command or it has alternate and command. So not uh, not terribly different than other Unix workstations you can find. Pretty quiet. Again, you know, Steve's not a big fan of noisy machines, so did what he could to keep the, keep the noise down. There is a fan there, obviously couldn't make it totally fanless like some of those other designs. Uh, it's interesting that the, the fan works to cool the power supply even when it pops off. Yeah, because again, yeah, it's, it's all going cool. through the bottom, so you, you can have the lid off and not worry too much. You're not getting a lot of airflow with the processor anyway, so this is definitely not one of those machines where the lid is absolutely required for airflow. It's definitely uh, served more of an aesthetic purpose. It's giving you a place to put this 40 pound monitor, which, you know, even in itself is kind of an interesting design. It's got these uh, rolling uh, wheels kind of thing here on the front. Uh, just, I don't really know what the purpose of all that is, but again, it's there because it's there. he could. Because he could do it, right? When you start your own company, you could do what you want. He could do that. So I'm going to pop this up here. Get an idea of what's going on on the screen. You can see this is a little dim. I mentioned that. Um, let's see if we can brighten it up. Here we go. Yeah, it was brighter. So, keyboard will uh, typical Unix type login, root user is default. See the dock over here? I, I know it's hard to see probably from the back. I was hoping to get one of those. Well, they could move up if they wanted to. That's true. I was hoping to have gotten one of those VGA adapter things to, to show it up here. But anyway, you kind of get an idea of what the desktop looks like. This is a, this is not the latest version of the Next Step operating system. Um, you kind of see the file browser here, and this works a lot like the modern Mac OS file browser. You kind of step your way through. Um, another kind of thing that shows up in modern day Mac OS, if you if you Look at the names of packages and things like that, it, like through the terminal, through the command line, you'll see they're called something dot app, right? And that's actually here, it's not even hidden. Um, like we'll see, we'll start out doing here in a second. And we'll see a lot of these, the executable, executable is literally called doom.app. <coughs> Double click that and fire that up. You can get to a command terminal here, just like you can on a typical Unix workstation. So a lot of, of course, of course, Jobs refused to allow a terminal uh, on Mac. So it's interesting that that he he, he did have because well, he, it was really it was Unix. Yeah. So it's hard to get away from. I would say most people are probably grateful that it's there. Oh yeah, absolutely. So anyway, you kind of see Doom running there. It's not, it's not huge, it's not great, there's no sound, etc. But you know, this is this is kind of where this thing started out. This version, um, you know, they compiled it first here before they even compiled it for, for is it, is the sound because you haven't hooked up the speakers or is it uh, no, literally this version does not include the sound. Oh okay. The, the sound files aren't there. It can play the sound, it can certainly do it, and I've seen uh, demos where people have got it working with the sound, but by default the package doesn't include the sound. It would probably involve some kind of hacking and, you know, taking the sound files out of another version and, and, uh, and getting them there, but uh, it is possible. And obviously if you had a color, uh, color uh, next station, this would be a problem. So, anyway, you kind of get a little bit of an idea what that, what that operating system looks like. Oh, saw the spinning beach ball there for a second. Is there a 
browser and open one for that meeting? There is. And it is right here. We also have an email client. We can, by default, it comes with an email from Steve Jobs himself, which is pretty nice. <laughs> and um, you know, even all these years later, that was not the right thing. That's the network's Do you, do you have a, a, a source for the, I don't mean source code, but I mean, a source for the executables for the browser and, and uh, Email client? Well, but they're built in. Well, at that point, they're built in. I mean, they're distributed with the operating system, with the later versions. So, like having the original one from Tim Berners Lee, you'd have to find that online or compile yourself, most likely. Um, but what's built in is obviously well, isn't that in Next Step 3.3 and newer. Isn't that the text? Isn't that like link? No, they have a graphical. It is, a, is it a graphical one? Yep. And if we had a network connection that actually had this this machine configured uh, for networking, if we had a network Ethernet connection here, we could actually get online with it. If I had known that, I could have tried to effort that. It would have been much more uh, exciting with a with a large display that everybody could see on this. Yeah. Yeah, and I was just thinking that. Hooking a, this up to to a projector I mean, with its non-standard yep. uh, video would be would be kind of you'd probably get a funky kind of a, a aspect ratio to the. You know, it takes it takes some work, right, to get it really get it really going. And yeah, you have to have probably a, a very specific projector to get a good quality display out of it. Yeah, that's a good question. Did they ever support multiple monitors with setups with some of the later ones? I'm not sure if the um, so the next cube the actually cube has cards. It right? has an additional. I mean, they, they do have expansion slots, but the next cube actually has an additional graphic subsystem called Next Dimension, um, and it may have some multi monitor capabilities. It was definitely designed for you know more high performance graphics. Obviously, it's in color on that side, and uh, and that sort of thing. This. Uh, these machines were not expandable in that particular way. So, there's one new bus expansion slot, but there's very little you can do with it because of the form factor. So let's take a look here. Welcome. So we got a little welcome email there. If we again, if we logged in as the actual uh, user rather than root, we would actually have our So what protocols, what, what email protocols are supported? Um, it's a typical SMTP client, so... Um, it'll just pop? It'll do pop and it'll do SMTP, obviously, for sending mail. I uh, don't think it supports IMAP or anything like that. No, well, that's, 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 certainly that's the real support. question. Yeah, and it's certainly not going to support anything like uh, any kind of SSL or anything like that. So. Well, that's going to lock, I mean, the. There's a, a move to encrypt the entire internet using SSL 1.2, which isn't supported by any vintage machine that I'm aware of. And, and you know, we require adding new libraries. Uh, new so, libraries. So okay. a lot of sites that used to open just fine, yep. no longer open on vintage yep. hardware. I've seen a video on at least one service where they're kind of proxying that. Um, I think it's called the oldinternet.com or something like that. I mean, it's, it's not like the Wayback Machine, right? I mean, you're familiar well, with that. You mean trying to... But it, it'll actually live proxy, you know, old websites and the, the render them in a, in a, in yeah, a modern yeah. browser. Because so. SSL is not so much a problem as JavaScript, right? So well, it's, you need something that will well, take a JavaScript and render that yeah, back. And it, it's it'll, like it'll deal with that. It'll deal with things like that. So there's some yeah. efforts being made to kind of, that. The, that's kind of the inverse of what you're looking for, because what it's trying to do yeah. is give, give you the old internet on a modern browser. We want the reverse. You know, well, take, take, take what this is capable of, 
SS, well, no SSL, and and put out 1.2 to the website, bring it back, strip the right. SSL, yes. and send it back to the browser. And rewrite it. Rewrite it. Because, yeah, even if you can come up with the software libraries to do it, uh, the, the, the computational power of, of most of these CPUs wouldn't be able to deal with uh, the decryption and, and everything, even if you could come up with the software to do it. It would probably take hours just to establish that initial connection because the, the you know, especially maybe know, not this machine. Well, the, well, the ones with with, with a think about with a graphic with a uh, math coprocessor, I would think they would. I mean, it's fun. Slow, but yeah, fun. It's, 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 it's going to be I mean, very slow anyway. anyway. Yeah, but to, to decrypt the two, uh, you know, two hundred two thousand forty-eight bit key. You know, on a 33 megahertz, even with an FPU. Yeah, you can see how much it is. Just go in and create a new SSH key that's that many bits and wait. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Take, take, take yeah. Not yeah. Going You're not going to be using this on the internet now. No, no. But that that would be a fascinating sure. sort of exercise if you could come up with a way to kind of a reverse proxy that would. I've seen a couple <laughs> projects that do that. It's a it's a total proxy, and it takes the page and it renders the JavaScript, and it basically converts it into a bunch of images. Yeah. And then sends it back to you, but it's also a lot of images to process for these systems. There's a lot of interesting things to kind of help us keep keep going. Um, what else can you do, right? You can't find some hardware, right? Uh, one thing about it, a, a later version is the next step, and then as they move into uh, OpenStep, which will run on <coughs> Windows NT, for example, uh, some versions of the next step will natively run on, on Intel hardware. Uh, there's a, uh, a guy that did a good, uh, a good video on YouTube that describes, he actually showed the process of taking, you know, Next Step, I think 3.3, and installed it on like a $500 4 6 packer bill, you know, from, from the same time period, just to kind of prove out, okay, this is kind of why they kind of lost the hardware game, uh, because, you know, yeah, this looks a lot cooler, but for 500 bucks, you Get the pack bell and throw the same operating system on it, have very similar capabilities. Uh, there's an next emulator as well called Previous. You know, how, how clever is that? Uh, obviously, lots of, uh, most of us probably interested in the, in the actual hardware, but if you want something to play around with, learn the operating system, run it maybe a little faster than it would run on, on the one. Something to take a look at. I haven't played with that personally. Uh, you have to get all the packages and everything to actually install the operating System, get the install and stuff like that. But it is available. So there are ways to experiment with these machines even before we say, well, I want to play with one, let me try it out. Or I don't want to wreck my disk, I want to fire it up and play around with it. You know, try an emulator, throw it on an old PC. Well See put it put in a, uh, a hard drive, you know, put a uh, an SD card right. emulator, exactly. hard drive emulator in and you know and speed speed things up. That's certainly a possibility. Again, fairly standard SCSI implementation here. You could do uh, a SCSI to SD card solution uh, to replace the hard drive. Questions? I know we've asked a few questions as we've gone around the room. Uh, I've got a lot of things up here. This is this is about as complete as you get. Uh, everything complete in box. Got all the manuals there. Don't have the original disk, unfortunately. Uh, got some. Got the printer over here. We didn't talk a lot about that. Uh, but it's a, uh, a printer that was specifically designed to go with this. All the imaging, all the um, visualization in Next Step is done through PostScript, even on the screen. Uh, so it does everything in PostScript here, sends it to the printer uh, natively, like that. There's, again, a few different revisions of these things. There's, they actually at one point made a color version of the printer. Uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of different things out there. The printers suffer from typical uh, laser printer problems of the time, brittle, Plastic brittle um, wheels that um, the rollers that, that move the paper through the printer. That's actually what's wrong with this particular one. It'll, it'll print, it'll image on the page, uh, but the paper will jam or things like that because those rollers get brittle and sticky and, uh, and so forth. I uh, believe the black hole, which we'll, I've got a slide here with some, some resources on as well, uh, but I believe there are a couple of folks out there that are actually doing replacement uh, rollers and parts for the printers. Uh, so you can at least get them. Yeah. Yeah. Are you aware of efforts to preserve the software and documentation for the next? 
Uh, not anything formalized. I know you know there's there's lots of archive sites that do that, that savers and, and things like that. But I'm not sure of anything that's uh, specific to Next. Although there are a couple of uh, pretty extensive Next user form communities. The manuals are easy to get. Uh, I mean, they're they're readily available on on eBay. So, uh, like it's about 2.88 floppy is an issue for preservation. Need a special drive. The, well, it's, it's, I'm not, there's not too many machines that will read the 2.8 floppies. Um, most of the software, though, seems to have been distributed on CD. Okay. Even though there's no CD here, you can get an external CD drive for this. Um, I believe there's third party as well as uh, next brand uh, external SCSI drives that will connect. This does have an external SCSI connector on the back, in case I failed to mention that. Then the Cube, of course, the newer ones have the, the CD ROM drive. Um, how are, are are they to get a hold of nowadays? What, an operating next stop, next step station like that. For me, I, I feel like we got lucky. Uh, you know, we found somebody that that had one available. Uh, this came from a university setting. It was used for music production uh, by a composer, and we actually had a good dialogue, and uh, and, and he allowed us to get a hold of it, uh, basically for not much more than the cost of shipping. Um, I mentioned I do have a pretty extensive collection. We do have a nonprofit uh, museum in Central Virginia that um, that we're collecting for. So every now and then you get lucky and somebody. Will yeah, you, you you are very fortunate. Yeah, there, basically uh, all it takes is money. Yeah, yeah, just like anything, right? Um, there's three hundred to a thousand dollars. You know, it seems to be. Uh, well, or fifty eBay or, 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 or even more. Well, I mean. You, and then shipping though, shipping is going to be the killer, right? If they don't ship it right, then you spend five hundred dollars and the monitor's crap. Yeah, exactly. What so in typically, anything that would apply to any kind of vintage computer collection, you know, certainly applies here, right? Shipping is a problem. Luckily, again, we had the original boxes with the original phone and everything, uh, so we had no sh we had no sh uh, shipping damage or any issues like that. Obviously, if you could find one at a place like an exchange, like we're going to have here, we can sign them here or find one locally. Uh, but again, there was only about 50,000 of these made ever, total, all families, all together across, you know, four or five years. Mm -hmm. So they're not obviously as popular as other machines, but a lot of times what you'll find too is you'll find like the slab. The slabs are pretty cheap. You can get them, you know, 100, 150 bucks just for the slab, uh, but no monitor, no keyboard, uh, no interface cables, things like that. And, and, and it's useless. Useless other than maybe spare parts. If you have one and you wanted a spare motherboard or you wanted to spare uh, you know, some of the spare components, spare power supply, things like that. I made that mistake. <laughs> hey, next, I'll grab that. Hey, yeah. It's got a round connector that looks like this too. It's all good. <laughs> no, watch out, watch out. It, ideally, again, you want, unless you already have some of the peripherals, you know, you want to look for a complete system if you possibly can, even yeah. though that makes it hard. Uh, they do show up on eBay every now and then. I have a saved listing just to kind of keep an eye on the market. Uh, but again, you, know, you get what you pay for sometimes, and you get uh, people just at just saying, oh, it's it's old, five thousand dollars, you know. But if you can't afford a Lisa, this is a good next uh, a next good yeah whatever. So what what next guys step. what interested you in the next in particular? I know you were talking about a lot of the innovative things about it, but I'm kind of curious why you are dedicating so much time of your life to this. It's obviously not for the big bucks. No, no. Um, so I think the thing that interested me, I mentioned a lot of the, a lot of my professional life is spent kind of in the ISP business or you know building out uh, networks to serve up uh, you know web based applications. And so, so I think for me personally, sort of its connection with uh, early internet uh, was one of the things that really drove me to it. I'm not a Mac user uh, primarily. Uh, I use Windows for most things and Unix for most things. I, I'm not as big of a Mac user. I do use uh, iPhone, mobile devices, things like that. But I don't use a Mac OS for my daily machine. I like the older Macs a lot better than the new ones. So it wasn't that for me. I'm not a programmer. I'm more of a hardware infrastructure guy. So. Um, it, it's interesting and compelling, and just for the whole, the big picture, right? I'm interested in IT history, computer history in general, um, and just the fact that it had so many things that made it uh, stand out in the marketplace and stand out in the industry, right? And influence so many different areas of our life. Um, but I think for me, prim primarily, was sort of those roots in the early internet and things like that. And just the fact that, you know, networking and building. I like Unix too, so uh, it's a Unix. System, 
like Unix workstations, things like that. So that's 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 my angle. You know, it didn't, and it does look cool. It, it could use some Lincoln lights, to be honest. It doesn't have any. Um, Cube, I think, has one one red light on it, but that's about it. So, um, other questions? Is the uh, I'm assuming not. Is the software stack have any openness to it? Like, can you kernel? Can you hack the kernel or anything? Yeah, I, I'm sure you can. I mean, I'm sure there's folks that have that have explored some of that. I mean, the fact that they released it on multiple uh, operating or multiple uh, hardware platforms, you know, makes me think there's some possibilities there. Uh, most of the customization, things like that. There's so much you can do with the with the development environment uh, that you can change the behavior of the operating system, and a lot of those things are exposed uh, through those libraries and so forth. So it's not completely closed off, and it was certainly built with developers and sort of uh, you know, educators and scientists and researchers. It was built with those kind of people in mind. So I kind of feel like there's some of that there, uh, but I'm not seeing like an active community of like kernel hackers. It's it's mock, so it, you know it's not it's not a regular Unix kernel. Well, it's the mock kernel. If you want to see the newer version of it, like after Apple bought them, or they kind of yeah, from the inside, they open source uh, an updated revision of the operating system you can download or offline. Yeah, and like like OpenStep, the, the newer versions of it is, is freely available. Yeah, um, Darwin, I think Darwin. it's called yeah, Darwin. It's called Darwin. Darwin. Yeah. Yeah. So, other questions? Yeah. Um, Regarding the peripheral uh, peripherals, I, I know the power button would be probably an issue, but can you just, uh, for at least the mouse, you can just use the normal Mac ADB mouse, I think, right? If you, well, if you have the ADB version, like this one, for example, is not ADB. Oh, okay, yeah, they're the co ADB. Yeah, the color cubes um, with the external sound box, some of those use ADB. That's something else to watch out for, too. Just because you've got a, a mouse or a keyboard with the next logo on it doesn't mean it's the right one for your machine. There's an ADB and a non-ADB, and they all use the same connector, and they all look like also look like PS2. It's a it's a little round connector. Study the if you study the pins, I'm sure there's differences, but I'm just at a glance. Oh, that looks kind of like PS2, or maybe ADB. Or no, it's neither one. Yeah. Yeah. So something to watch out for. The uh, if you study the uh, ads on auctions on uh, eBay to see, you know, because you can easily tell a non-ADB. Uh, keyboard from from ADB. They they look different, yeah. and so does the mouse. Yeah, the mouse has a more rounded sort of puck like shape. Uh, it, you can tell it's newer it, it, in terms of when you look at the design. I mean, this is very sort of industrial looking keyboard. Uh, the ADB keyboards are designed a little differently, and the mouse is much more like some of the wacky mice that Apple came up with in the mid in the mid nineties. It's it's kind of roundish and strange. I actually like this better personally. Does it have two buttons or had you see that time? No, two button. buttons, man. Look at that. Two buttons and a nice <laughs> little removable roller ball. But two know. buttons is still a compromise, right? Because Unix should have three buttons. So he <laughs> still was a was still one, one less than what the you Mac is one, but the next um, <laughs> They didn't they didn't invest a, you know, they certainly didn't invest a lot of innovation right here. Other questions? Could you put up the source the slide with the sources? Yep. Right here. So this is just a few things. Obviously, got to promote the, the Vintage Computer Forums, the festival. Uh, as I mentioned, the my understanding is the museum has a cube uh, on display, and and I believe there will be at, at least one on display in the uh, in the festival uh, Saturday and Sunday. If you come back for that. Part of the Unix. Um, yeah, I think it's part of the big Unix exhibit. Yeah. Um, Anyway, this is a great book. I got a couple books up here that aren't part of the, the actual package, right? This is uh, this is the one I recommended here, Bruce Webster. The next book, of course, because why not, right? And this is the next big thing, and they're all in the past, and so don't get confused. There's uh, this has a lot of good information. This guy kind of followed the building and development and release of the machine, so he was kind of on the inside. There's good stuff here. Um, this is original. This was the original next computer. Before it was called the cube, but it was a cube, right? Uh, so he's got pictures of the cube, hybrid, you know, good photos in here for the time period, you know, showing you how the, the board slide in and out of the cube. The cube is actually fun. There's a couple guys that have done teardowns on, on YouTube. If you're interested, watch one of those videos because the, the cube literally like comes apart. It, it's really fascinating. There's that optical disc, 256 megabyte capacity. Uh, that was on that original. Uh, that was a lot. 
Yeah, yeah, yes, that's absolutely. Cool. That's for removal in 19, remember, 1988 was when this thing was announced. So, um, and it's got some, some decent resolution. When did it actually come out? 89 was when they started uh, shipping to universities, and then 1990 was actually available kind of to the general public. It was like 10 grand, right? Uh, yes, when it was released to the general public, the original cube was 10 grand. They offered a discount to universities like 6,500. That was one of them. Oh, it was priced competitively with the lease. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And today, it's a little cheaper than the lease, which is nice. So if you can't afford a lease like me, uh, this is a good this is a good fallback because it's still interesting and innovative, and it still has Steve Jobs fingerprints on it. So it's 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 fun. But anyway, I, I recommend this. This is good. It's got a lot of typical type, you know, technical manual that you would expect from a third party. Really, uh, pretty well done. So you showed that Doom was developed on it. I'm curious why why you happen to know the story behind. It seems like odd to develop Doom on it when it was really they, successful they on the PC well, flat. Platform. Again, everything's got nuance to it, right? So they built it. They needed something. They needed that multitasking, uh, you know, reliable kernel to build. They built the graphics engine right. using, using this. So they needed something uh, reliable. And I think the development environment, I'm sure that played a part in it as well. I think it would be a, a big advantage. Yeah, it would be an advantage for writing that. And of course, you know, do, I mean, sorry, uh, next applications. You're sort of natively multi-platform, right? You can compile the same application on Next, and you can compile it for Intel, you can compile it for uh, for Motorola, later versions you can compile it for PowerPC. I, I read uh, risk process oh, things like that. So yeah, I read on the internet some story that Carmack was fascinated with this and bought one the day it was available yeah, for everyone. Yeah, like much, a yeah, cash yeah, on delivery and he had no car and he had to walk through the snow <laughs> to like go to the post office and he had like a Ten thousand dollar catch on the so it's got to be real. He wanted well, it's, it's, the story was from him. And it's also in his book. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I've seen the same thing. Absolutely. I mean, he, they were, he was very much an, uh, an early adopter of this of this platform, and obviously saw some great potential, and and felt like maybe for obviously for running the, the, the program, they're going to release it on something that's widely available. But for that development effort, uh, this was an advantage to them, even probably the display, just the, the, the high resolution and so forth. Uh, all those things would have been, right. you know, welcome. I think as a developer working on a company. So they did, they did the development on this, but they really were writing it for the mass market, obviously. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they released. I mean, obviously, Doom is a, even at the time. Of course, in modern day, it's been ported to everything on the planet. Uh, but even back then, Doom was uh, uh, available on SGI, for example, um, as as another platform. And then of course SGI, I mean that's all another story, right? SGI is a development platform for Nintendo 64. You know, so there's a lot of this kind of stuff that goes on historically. And look at you know the power and the uh, the capability of a development workstation. Uh, a lot of times, especially then, would far exceed the, the capability of the machine that the target application was actually going to run. Right. It's like when they use the it's Lisa like to now, develop. Right. You know, I got to have everything in the world to develop the app that's going to run over here on this twelve dollar phone. Um, but I got to have you know fifty thousand dollar development set up. So I, yeah. I, obviously, you can find stuff on the internet, Google, YouTube, etc. There are a few. There's not a lot of resources, but there are a few uh, few good folks that have done reviews and done uh, uh, teardowns and things like that on, uh, on YouTube. Black Hole is a company we mentioned as a as a vendor for parts and things like that. I think you buy whole systems from them as well. Uh, but one of the only the only place to, that I know of to get. Sound, uh, sound boxes. Yeah, I mean, and, 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 and sound boxes are two hundred and twenty-five dollars <laughs> just for this little box. Yeah, just for that little yeah. triangular yeah. thing. And in case you're wondering, all that sound for the monochrome system, all that sound box is inside here. The only reason it's external and the color version is because they had a third party make the monitor, and they didn't want to build it into the monitor. They want to change the design of the monitor, so they just bought a third party monitor, slapped the next badge on it. And then they just said, well, we need all these guts for the sound box. We'll just build it in a little wedge and stick it on the table because why not? Well, it had, to, it had to be on the table. You couldn't, you know, I mean, the system yeah, it actually had to be put somewhere else. It, and it had, you know, the keyboard and mouse connected to it as well. So. Yeah. Uh, Nextcomputers.org is, is one of the uh, next user forums that's available that has a lot of good active posts and things like that. Thanks. I uh, appreciate the time. We're at, we're at the end of our time. I know we've got another speaker coming here in a few minutes. So, 
enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks for coming. Thank you.